Hello, my name is Andrei Lacho and I'm a research assistant professor in Stony Brook University. Today I will talk about evolutionary crystal structure prediction and its alternatives. The task that we are trying to solve with our algorithm and other people in the world are trying to solve with their algorithms is, in my opinion, one of the main problems in the field of material science. It's a twofold problem. So, we want to be able to predict the structure of material at a given condition. For example, what's the structure of a mineral deep inside the earth? Or what happens if we heat, apply the heat to material, if we pressurize it, if we apply pressure, if we apply stress or put it into electric field? So ability to predict a structure at given condition would be actually very handy for us. And second part of the problem is what should be the structure of a material to have desired properties? It's actually a question of material design, whether we can create a material with given, for example, electrical properties, if you want to build better accumulators for home electronics, for example, whether we can build uh, some high TC superconductors, some extra hard materials, and so on. The question is important, and uh, in this talk I will mainly speak about structures, because for me, as a theoretician and computational scientist, the structure defines the material. It is a material for me. If I have a structure, I can use modern state-of-the-art methods to calculate all the range of properties that I'm interested in. And even if you are experimentalist, that you can actually obtain very nice, interesting material. But if you don't have a structure, you won't publish the result. You have something, you have properties of that something, but if you don't know the structure, you don't know what you have, actually. So it's important to know the structure, and it allows you to characterize your material. However, till recently, it was impossible to predict crystal structures, and about 20 years ago, there was an interesting paper called Are Crystal Structure Predictable? And the answer was clear, no. And the answer was no because, well, from a chemical point of view, the question is rather trivial. What's a configuration, what's arrangement of atoms that has the lowest free energy? However, if you look at it from a mathematician's point of view, then the problem is extremely complex. First of all, the dimensionality of the problem is increasing with the number of atoms in the unit cell. So it's a highly dimensional problem, and the complexity is increasing actually exponentially with the number of atoms in the unit cell. At the end, the problem is like this. You have huge and very noisy landscape, and you have to find the, really the lowest point on this landscape. It's like trying to find a diamond ring somewhere in Himalayas. You know that ring is somewhere there, but, well, good luck trying to find it. Let's illustrate it in an example. Just imagine that you have a cubic cell, and you divide it by 10 by 10 by 10 subcells, and just trying to put atoms in different subcells and trying to sample all possible configurations. It turns out that even for relatively small systems, for example, with just 10 or 20 atoms in the unit cell, the amount of possible configuration is astronomical or even well beyond astronomical. Even if we use all the computational power available to mankind, it would take us longer than the age of universe to try all possible composition. So we cannot try all possible structures, and our best bet would be to use empirical methods, methods where we have some reasonable probability to obtain some reasonable structure in reasonable time. Of course, there is no guarantee that we will obtain it, but usually the results are quite good, and here is the list of the methods. Uh, people first started to try to predict crystal structure using computational methods in early 90s, with very simple methods like random sampling and simulated annealing. And uh, I would say the breakthrough came in uh, about 10 and 5 years ago, when more powerful algorithms like metadynamics and minimum hoping and evolutionary algorithms were developed, and when we actually had better supercomputers, because all these computational methods rely on our ability to find the local minimum to perform the local optimization, which is a computationally very demanding task. The idea is that, well, what is a local optimization? Imagine that we obtain structures somewhere here on this slope. Local optimization allows us to go to the nearest minima. 
So now, instead of having to guess exactly this point to have the minimum structure, you can land anywhere here. So you just have to land in this interval and then you have your answer. In fact, this reduces the dimensionality of problem by a lot and smooths this very noisy search space. However, it's very computationally consuming thing. If you want to do it really from the first principle, using some abomination methods, you need a lot of computational power. And actually progress in building supercomputers in the last 20 years made it possible to do calculations, to do this sort of calculation, and now crystal structure prediction is quite a blooming field. Today I will shortly present our method that we call USPECH, Universal Structure Predictor, Evolutionary Crystallography. It was developed around 2006 and already in the last five to six years we predicted over 30 different nodal structures, new phases of materials at high pressure. And also there are many more different proposals of novel structure that have yet to be verified experimentally. All you have to know to start the calculation is just the chemical formula and conditions. For example, pressure. We want to find the structure of carbon, for example, at 100 GPA. You start the calculation, you press the button, then there are some calculations on supercomputer and in a few days or week or months, depending on how much computational power you have, you have your answer. Uh, as you can see, there are many publications in high-ranked journals like Nature, PNAS, uh, Physical Review Letters, and we are not only researching this field, there are many other groups that are doing, uh, developing their own algorithms, and in general this field is developing really fast. More and more novel phases of materials are actually discovered not in the lab, that was common 10, 20 years ago, but on the supercomputers. Now, let me explain different approaches to this problem on this sort of cartoon. So, imagine that you want to put a kangaroo on top of Mount Everest, highest point on the Earth. So, the random sampling approach is like flying around the Earth on a plane and just dropping a kangaroo in random spots and telling it to climb up to the nearest hill. And you just fly around, you repeat it, you drop the skin grooves for a year, 10 years, maybe a million years, and at some stage you will fly above the Mount Kilimanjaro, drop skin grooves there, and it will climb there, and you'll have your reward. So, in principle, such approach works if you have a small system. But as you remember, with increasing, when you increase the number of atoms, the complexity is increasing exponentially, and the search space becomes more and more complex. That's why it's extremely hard to use this method uh, to produce structures with many atoms in itself, for example, 30, 40, 50. You need millions and millions of structures to have some reasonable result. Next method is slightly more complicated. You start just with one kangaroo, drop it somewhere, tell it to climb to the nearest hill, then make it really drunk and joyful and full of energy. And it just goes around, it climbs down the hill, goes to the next hill, then climbs down all that hill, and it just wanders around. And at some stage, you hope that during this travel, it will, hold, it will go to the Mount Everest. Another sort of similar approach is minima hoping. When you push kangaroo harder and harder from the hill, and at some stage, it just goes downhill and climbs to the nearest hill. And also, in this method, you remember the hills that you visited and try to not visit them again. And if you by accident visit them again, you push it really hard just to end away out of this. Evolutionary algorithm is different approach. It's a population-based approach, so you start with a population of kangaroo. For example, we populate the ears with kangaroos. And then we let them breed, create children, and at some stage we come and eliminate all the kangaroos at low altitudes. So what happens, uh, the kangaroos that survive are sort of like mountain kangaroos. They are on higher altitudes, they create children, and again, we come and shoot the ones with the lowest altitude. In this way, we create some sort of evolutionary pressure that pushes this population of kangaroos higher and higher into the mountains, Still, well, there will be only one left, the one in the Mount Kilimanjaro. 
And this method is actually extremely powerful and it's often used in other areas of global optimization. So the block scheme of algorithm of our algorithm and all similar algorithm is quite simple, like with kangaroos. We start with initial population, in our case different structures. Usually they are produced randomly, but there are also more sophisticated methods to produce them if you know something about your system. Then out of this structure you choose the best one, the one with the best energy for example, and produce children, new structure using so-called heredity, when a few parents give a child mutation, when one parent produces a child, and also you let a few best structures to survive. And then you repeat this process again and again, like in evolution, and at some stage you just stop the calculation, you check the best structure and hope that you guessed correctly the answer. Uh, the evolutionary operators in our case are physically reasonable. And that's actually an important thing because the first algorithms, first genetic algorithms that people tried to apply in 19th failed mainly because they were not physical. Here we have physical operators, for example, for heredity we cut a slices from different unit cells and then combine them into one child. For example, upper slice from structure A, lower slides from structure B, we combine them, we locally optimize, and here we have a child that has some features of parent A, some features of parent B. There are different sorts of mutations. Some of them are here. For example, in latest mutation, we distort the cell, and thus we rearrange the atoms. We can swap the identities of atoms, which we call permutation. We can just keep the cell intact and move only atoms, so-called coordinate mutation. We do all the things and it looks like this. So this is gold palladium alloy and at the beginning, in the first generation, we randomly generate structures all over the place, all over the search place. So there are structures here, there are some of them are better in the blue region, some of them are worse. And when we proceed with our procedure, one can see that there are more and more structures here in this blue region. So what actually happens is that Evolutionary algorithms captures in what area of the search space we have good structures and mostly produce kids in that area. So we are sort of like zooming in the most promising area and at some stage we receive an answer. And that's why of the reason why this approach is quite successful. So you start from sampling more or less the whole space, or well, at least you hope you will sample it with your structure and then you choose the best structure to survive and thus zoom into those promising regions. There is also another interesting population-based method that I'll shortly discuss here and it's so-called particle sperm optimization. So we also start with population of kangaroos and every kangaroo is now driven by three forces. One is homesickness, it's the desire to return to the highest visited mountain by this specific kangaroo that travels around. So, the highest mountains that he already visited, he calls home and wants to go there. He also has an arch to explore and wander in random directions. And the third force is the will to go to the capital, the highest mountain sampled by all the kangaroo in the population. And by balancing these three forces, you can actually build quite an effective search in the area around those kangaroos. And it works however, works, however, it works not that nice as evolutionary algorithm. We implemented uh, this particle far optimization and compare it on a system of reasonable size. So 28 atoms in the unit cell is actually quite big for our field. As you can see, the success of our algorithm was 100%, but for PSO it was not that good. However, if you look at how many structures you have to locally optimized to obtain the answer in those cases where you guess it. You can see that for PSO it's usually a very fast process. So PSO is good in exploring the local area where the initial structures landed. If you have a structure that's close to the global minimum, PSO will find it fast. If the global minimum is away from the structure that you had in the beginning, well, bad luck. That's why you can actually improve the method by a lot if on every generation you add new blood, new random structures. And that's actually, we believe, is the success of method, for example, of Wang and collaborators. 
So for PSO, you really need this new blood to explore the area efficiently. But still, as you can see, evolutionary algorithm is better. And why exactly is it better? Well, first of all, let me show you some interesting picture. Uh, this is a system that has 160 atoms in the unit cell. It's garnet pyrope. And till recently, well, it was impossible even for our method to beat it. But recent developments actually allow us to achieve the 100 success rate for such a huge system. Actually, it's extremely big. No other method comes, general method comes even close to beating systems of that size with such high success rate. If you think about it, that even the dimensionality of the problem is something close to 500. So we have 500 dimensional search space and somewhere there you have to find this global minimum and our method does just that. Why? Well, first of all, we try to implement a smart operators. So we want to have operators that have high success probability because the bigger is your system, the smaller is probability for a random operator to get a good result. So random operator is like kangaroo walking in a random direction from a hill. We don't actually want it. For example, we can say, okay, what if it tries to go in the direction of the highest mountain path? Maybe it has higher probability to have high mountain there compared to low mountain pass. Well, maybe it doesn't work in nature with mountains, but it certainly works with crystal structures. There is a general chemical principle, and it was proven that if you, in some local minimum, and if you go into the direction of the lowest saddle point on your energy landscape, then you have high probability to end in some other low minimum compared to going to some other direction. So what we do, we can actually move the atoms along the eigenvector of the softest modes. It requires a calculation of the dynamical metrics. We don't really need to calculate the phonons, but we have to calculate the dynamical metrics, have this approximate direction and just walk there. And uh, the success rate is increased dramatically. Actually, it's a very powerful operator and with high probability you end up in a good or even a better state. To illustrate, let me show you two examples. One of them is gamma boron. It's actually quite a complex system in the sense that almost no method can solve it without any constraint. So if you don't give the unit cell, the lattice parameter just wants to find the structure having 28 boron atoms, most methods fail. Our method doesn't and soft mutation is one of the tricks that makes it happen. As you can see, the soft mutation improved the structure and found the global minimum. And there is quite a dramatic rearrangement of atoms here. And from this structure, just with one soft mutation step, we jumped into the real minimum. Here is another example of coesite. And you can see that very distorted ground state was found just with one soft mutation. So this soft mutation improved the structure drastically. And that what it usually does. So this is a smart move. Smart move has higher success probability and that's extremely helpful for big system. Another sort of, or another way of being smart is to use some specific parameters that tell us how good is specific part of a crystal, how nicely arranged it is and so on. We developed a new parameter that called local order. And uh, here we have illustration of it, blue atoms are atoms with low order, red with high order. You can see if you have some distortion or some defects, the area around defects has low order. While the area where you have a nice pattern, a nice arrangement of atom has high order. So what you can do now? For example, you can mutate only those atoms that have bad order and leave those nicely placed atoms intact. Or when you make a child in a heredity, you can choose the highest order at slab. So instead of taking some randomly positioned atoms, you take the atoms that are nicely positioned. And it increases the success rate of the operators by quite a lot. And actually you receive the decent child. So if you have two parents and those two parents have some decent part, then algorithm tries to extract those part and form a child out of those part. And it really works. Another thing that's uh, 
actually was a big improvement is so-called aging techniques. So with many methods and also with the evolutionary algorithms we have a problem when we find some really good mountain. For example, instead of Mount Everest, we found the Kilimanjaro. It's a high mountain. And kangaroo on that mountain start to produce a lot of children and other kangaroos are killed. So if you don't have any kangaroos near higher mountains, we can be screwed because our food population is just sitting on top of Kilimanjaro and don't going anywhere. And there is a long way to Gimalaya actually. So what we can do, we can slightly make this hill smaller and smaller. So if we see that kangaroo is sitting somewhere for too long or our structure is not changing, the best structure for too long, we can artificially make an aging and make the structure worse and worse. So like make this mountain smaller and smaller and at some stage it will just walk away and continue the search. It's quite effective, especially if you have many good minima. minima. And that's typical for big system. So here is interesting example of so-called Leonard Jones cluster nanoparticle with 38 atoms. It's interesting because it has two extremely good minima that are very close to each other. And minima that is slightly worse is nice and big and broad and it's very easy to find it. And the most methods find it and are just stuck there because the real minimum is small and shallow and it's hard to produce it. But with this aging techniques you can see that yeah, first we land in that big and nice metastable state, but at some stage we are pushed out of it and then find the real minimum. So the combination of all these smart moves, aging techniques and all this stuff makes the algorithm extremely powerful. So there is actually a big change in the size of the systems that we can study. We can now reliably study system of more than 100 atoms actually. And just a few more slides. Mm, remember that I talk about material design. Actually, we can do it as well. Typical crystal structure prediction algorithm finds the structure with the best energy because that's what experimentalists are usually interested in. So they apply a pressure, they receive the structure, and usually it's the structure with the lowest energy or some good metastable state. But then we realized, okay, if we can find the structure with lower energy, why cannot we find the structure, for example, with highest hardness? or with the smallest volume per atom. Actually, we can just slightly modify an algorithm and obtain very interesting result. Indeed, we can do it. For example, we try to minimize the volume of carbon and actually we found three structures that are denser than diamond. So it's almost like a miracle because before that people thought that diamond was really the densest material. Those three structures also have interesting optical properties. So if you somehow could make them and cut against stone, they would outshine diamond. So they are really interesting. We applied this method to search for the hardest polymorph of carbon. And uh, actually we found a lot of very hard structure. We found the diamond that is the hardest and lots, lots of daylight that is slightly softer. But we also have a full range of different structures that have a comparable hardness. So you can search for a material with given properties using this approach. And last thing that I would like to present is that nowadays with our method you don't even have to know the exact chemical composition. You just have to know the main elements that are in, for example, in the system of interest. And it's especially handy for studying the alloy. So you can make a variable composition system and answer the question. So if you take, for example, a system that consists of some amount of iron and some amount, for example, of magnesia, what all possible stable structure can we build of them? What will be their stoichiometries, the exact formula, and what will be the structure? We can answer that and in one calculation we can actually get this whole convex hull. So we can get the most stable iron, the all most stable magnesium structure, and all the stable structure in between. So it's really powerful method. And this is my last slide. So why this approach is successful? To be honest, no one really knows. Even people who work for decades with evolutionary algorithm cannot really say why it's so successful for such a big problem. Because it's essentially an heuristic method and there is no guarantee that you obtain your answer. But usually you do. And one of the reasons is probably the learning 
power of the algorithm because population usually carries a lot of information that you can exploit and you refine it you choose the best structure and you produce the kids out of them and by refining this information you obtain your structure here is an example of calculation of alpha boron built with these nice clusters you can see that even in the very first generation the best structure already has some features of the final state so you can see how these icosahedral uh, clusters are forming so the main idea is that evolutionary algorithm captures some good features keeps them refines them and obtains an answer and the summary is very simple that evolutionary approach is a powerful method for crystal structure prediction thank you very much